All right. Welcome back to the podcast. I have Lou Mangiello with me from LouMangiello.com and WDWRadio.com. I'm excited to chat with him. Lou, how are you, my friend? Good seeing you. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to see you again. So tell everybody a little bit about what you do and where you do it before we get into the conversation. So um, I am a recovering attorney who basically talks about <laughs> Walt Disney World for a living. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I was a lawyer in New Jersey and wrote a book about Disney. And uh, I've been podcasting about Disney and Marvel and Star Wars for about 16 years over at WW Radio, as well as um, I do live video and, and events and have books and audio tours. When did you start your podcast? Uh, spring 2005. Wow, like 100 years ago on podcast. <laughs> right? It's funny. I say that to people like, no, 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 Lou, you mean 2015. I'm like, no, I mean 2005. Like, I'm old. How did you even do a podcast back then? Uh, we had like two sticks we would rub together. <laughs> and, and, you know, and to a certain degree, Bruce, it was because literally the medium was just a couple of months old. Um, and I was always a, a tech nerd. And I had a buddy who was a, a geek as well. Um, really just believe that the power of the spoken word is so much greater than anything you could convey in, in text. Plus, I stink at typing, so it was perfect. So we literally, um, you know, figured out how to record a podcast and, you know, hand code our XML feed, which I still do to this day, <laughs> and, um, and, and put it up and, and hope that people would find it. These podcasting kids nowadays will never know what it's like back then. <laughs> right. <laughs> You just sign up for Anchor, record something on your phone, and upload it to the cloud. It, which is the beauty of the medium, and I love the fact that anybody and everybody can be a publisher. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing – I started this podcast in 2000, like late 2014, early 2015, when I really started to publish consistently. And that was – I thought that was really – so that you were doing it already 10 years in. Yeah, which is part of the reason why my show is called WDW Radio was because I had to convey to people very quickly and clearly that what I was doing was some sort of a spoken word medium. The kids who listen to your podcast now will be like, Lou, what's radio mean? <laughs> yes, right. No, actually, I get the opposite, which is I'll, I'll like meet people in the parks and be like, I've been listening to you since I was in grade school. And I'm like, yikes. And he's like, here's my wife and kids. So, which is, it's wonderful. And, it, and it's, it's incredible to, um, to been able to do this for so long. Yeah, because people listen to you. If they really started listening to you back in 2005, 2000, you know, my kids are 19, 18, and 14. And like, they were born back then. So they, like, you've, <laughs> right. you've been podcasting almost their whole life. Not to make you, not to make you feel old or anything. Yeah, I didn't until just now, but thank you. Because know, you start putting numbers on it, then it makes it real. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all good. But you also do like you you do a great job of like building community, and you've been doing a live show as well. Talk about the live show that you do, and why did you start to do a live show instead of just the podcast? So I've been live broadcasting um, going back to 2007, um, and the same thing, Bruce, because you mentioned community. It's it's the foundation it's the core of what i do because we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the people around us that listen and, and help um the show and, and community grow and i used to have a again this is pre-social media so i had a discussion forum on my site going back to early like january 2004 and the one thing about um being a content creator, a, a publisher of, of something like this is you put out a podcast and then you wait, right? We sit back and then we wait for comments. We wait for reviews. We wait for people to start talking about it. And I love the idea of not just having sort of a quote unquote face to face, but having that real time conversation and engagement. And back in 2007, there was a, a new technology platform called Ustream that would allow everyday people like me to broadcast from their basement in New Jersey. Um, and the first time I did it, I, I will never forget, I told my wife uh, at the time, I said, listen, I'm gonna try this new thing. I'll be on for like 10 minutes and then I'll be up and you know, we'll watch Lost or whatever. <laughs> Six hours later, she comes downstairs and she's like, who the blank are you talking to? She's like, I can hear you through the air conditioning. I'm like, I don't know, like I'm talking to, and there's just people and they're watching. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, I have no idea. It started about Disney, but it sort of, evolved or devolved into just regular conversation. And, and that was a very eye-opening moment for me because it shows that people want to belong, they want to be part of a community, and they love that ability to feel like they are part of something and help direct where the show goes and get those real-time reactions from you. Yeah. 
you know, that was a long time ago. You stream. Wow. That's like, yeah. did you literally say live from my basement in New Jersey? This is Lou Mangiello from <laughs> WW Radio. That would be an amazing intro right now. It's sort of what I did. It's, it's, it's kind of what I did. Um, but this community formed around that. I remember when I first went live from a, a remote event, same thing. People would walk over and they're like, why you, why is this weirdo talking to his laptop in the corner? I'm like, and I said, not thinking, I said, oh, there's just these people and they're watching in, the, in this box. And somebody sort of picked up on that. And they're like, we're the box people. Like we're the box people that live in Lou Mangello's basement. And they made logos and they had a design contest and all these things. And that's what they called themselves. And then sort of the box people was this thing that, that again, they, I just built the clubhouse. They create, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they're the ones who populate it. Right. They took this thing and ran with it. And that, and that too was very interesting and still, you know, remains to this day. What's, what's, what's changed for you? So you've been doing it for a long time now. 2007 was like, you know, 14 years ago, live streaming. And, you know, back then, or even like four or five years ago, live streaming wasn't as popular in on every platform like it is now now everybody live streams everything and there's almost a little bit too much of it like what's changed for you over the years how do you continue to keep that community engaged and not um drift off because there's so much content and live stuff out there so and that's it man you got to focus not on what the platform is because i've bounced from Ustream to periscope to meerkat to you know every other you know different iteration along the way right so that doesn't matter because i think if you're if you're putting out good stuff and i believe you have to care at scale right i i and i think we've talked about this conferences like the numbers don't matter to me right and i think so many people are concerned concerned and consumed with vanity metrics trying to grow the number of downloads the number of likes the number of followers hearts I don't care about that. Like I care about the people who are there. And if you do that, if you care at scale, they will not just follow you from platform to platform, but they will be the ones to help those numbers, that community grow because they'll say, Oh, Hey, you're a Disney fan. You're a Marvel fan. You should come check out this podcast. You'll like this community because it's very warm. It's very welcoming. It's drama free, knock on wood. Um, and that's the way things grow organically. And that's why, you know, I hate to use the buzzwords, but that's why engagement and reach is so strong because of the foundation of the people that's there. Yeah, except Twitter. Twitter's, Twitter's a <laughs> it's nasty. It's a cesspool. Yeah, it's a cesspool, man. It's, it, yeah. I feel like Twitter's the only platform where it's, it's consistently people who are trolling other people. Because they're protected by that veil of anonymity, right? Your name is Dopey Dude Seventy Seven. You could say whatever you want. <laughs> I know that guy. It, it, yeah, well, <laughs> it could be. Wait a minute. What's your you? Because <laughs> you you have that keyboard courage, right? Which is very yeah. empowering. It's easy to be a bully if you don't have to, you know, look the person in the eye and stand to them face to face. Um, and and it's unfortunate that it has allowed itself to devolve to a certain degree because I was an early adopter to Twitter and I love I used to love the conversations that yeah. were there. Um, I don't think it's a place to sort of build the foundation of community, but it is one of the arms and extensions of it. Yeah, I mean, Facebook doesn't seem to have those people who have uh, anonymity on there. It seems to be the real names. I wonder why other platforms don't pick up on that because Facebook, if you do put something out there, you, everybody knows you put something out there. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about the whole anonymity thing and like, sharing your opinions but it does make it easy to make bully other people or make other people feel bad when it isn't something that you know you could easily have a twitter burner account and go on other people's accounts and right. write whatever you want and there's no backlash to you where on facebook it doesn't happen as often although there are some bullies on facebook and they could care less what you think and they're just you know there's mean people unfortunately everywhere but that's why it's so critical to create and grow your community when I say the right way, Bruce, what I mean is by not baiting people into it with, you know, uh, a, a lead magnet or something that's going to sort of trick them to come in. Oh, you know, enter our contest, join our community, because then they're there for the wrong reasons. Yeah. If you get people in for the right reasons, and I believe we are our magnets for the type of people that we want to attract. And if you are genuine and authentic in your online persona, the way you should be, the same way you are in real life. I think that's what helps to, to foster um, the right kind of community that does not have 
that drama and nonsense go on in it. Yeah, yeah. No funnel in the world is going to help you if you're a jerk. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like that. I you know? like that. I hate that word funnel, by the way. Like, I, do I do marketing and like local businesses and talk about marketing all the time, but I hate the word funnel. I, I hate the, I hate that that word is associated with marketing because I like what you're doing. And I think, you know, we work with a lot of local businesses and they should look at what they do for marketing, kind of like what you do for your community, right? Like you want to build a, bu a bunch of people who want to hang out and like what you do and want to share what you do for you. So that way you don't have to build that stupid funnel. I'm with you, brother. I, I hate the word. I almost, I, and I don't like, I don't, I've never had a funnel. Like I've literally never had that sort of process. And I know that I am leaving, you know, people and marketers will say I'm leaving money on the table and I'm cool with that because right. I would rather, and I sacrifice is the wrong word, but I would rather not have that for the integrity of the group that's there. Yeah. It makes, it puts a different feel to the community when you have these funnels and lead pages and, uh, lead magnets and all these things to get people to know who you are. It's okay to like promote your podcast, sure. and like your, your live and like use social media as a way to get the word out. But it's almost like tricking. I don't know. I don't want to say it's tricking people, but it's almost kind of like tricking people into like being aware of you versus if you do put stuff, good stuff out into the world, it may take a little bit longer, but people will find you if you're good enough. I agree a thousand percent, man. And, and to be honest and transparent, like I have never, I've never run a paid ad. Like I've done it just to sort of learn how it works, right. like how Facebook ads and things like, but I don't, I don't run ads. And again, I know I quote unquote should be, but I think that if you, you know, if we're talking about community and I think if you build a loyal, engaged community, they will be and become your most positive, passionate evangelists. And I think it's, far more compelling to have a friend of yours say, hey, you need to go and check this restaurant out, Disney World out, this podcast out, than me seeing an ad and having to click on something be like, oh, this looks interesting. The recommendation of peers is, is far more um, important and I think compelling. Yeah. Do you, so you're, you're probably an advocate of podcasting, if I'm not wrong. Am I wrong? Am I wrong about that? I, I wave the podcast podcasting flag very hard man all right good do you think every business should have a podcast or every person should have a podcast <laughs> well every is a is a bit to say every might be you know a little bit too broad but i think that any look anybody can podcast especially now because you mentioned some of the platforms and technologies that I mean, make prime it very, example very of that right there yeah <laughs> if i can podcast anybody can podcast but it's utilizing the medium for for you the right way right um and depending on what your business is yeah there might be a podcast that's in there and i think what you have to do is not think about it from a marketing perspective but think about it as a consumer from a value perspective why should i one why do you want to do the podcast what do you want to happen as a result of it and then why should somebody listen what's the value exchange for their time because look we are in a what's in it for me society right now, right? We're not going to do something unless we're going to get something out of it. We're not going to click on an ad. We're not going to watch a video. We're not going to listen to a podcast and, and devote 15 minutes to two hours, whatever it might be of our time, unless we're going to be entertained, informed, educated, whatever it might be. So you have to figure that out. What is the value that I'm able to bring somebody in exchange for their time? And then what's my ROI? What is my potential business's return on that investment? Yeah. I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to guess that you get asked 75 times a day if someone should start a podcast. Am I close? Very. Okay. I, I assume because I get asked quite a bit and I know you've been podcasting for a lot longer than I have. So, and I always tell people because they look at people who are success and I put success in quotes because you never know what success really looks like behind the scenes. People flaunt success and it's Instagram success, <laughs> not real success. Um, so, people look at successful podcasters and they're like, Oh, I want to do that. And I get asked quite a bit. Um, so I want to hear your opinion on this, but this is what I tell people when they say, Hey, I want to start a podcast. I always tell people like you can start a podcast because it's pretty simple nowadays. We talked about that earlier, but you should start a podcast that about a topic that you would like or love to talk about for a year or two without making any money. 
Bruce, you and I are very much in alignment, brother. Um, because before, and I'll tell you, before I even get to that, uh, I think why is the most powerful word out there. And you've got to really sit down and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Right. And if the answer is, I think I can make money, then, I, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. Because as an extension of your doing it for a year, uh, per, imagine doing it for a year with no expectation of making any money whatsoever, but having the obligation, because it is, because we're creatures of habit, of being consistent. Your show comes out every Monday. We expect that you should see that show, hear that show every single Monday. Yeah. Can you be consistent when you're not feeling it, when your friends are going out, when your family's having a picnic and you've got to record and edit and do all the other things that go beyond just, you know, hitting start and stop on the record button um, to create a podcast because you know that there is a, a marketing element to it. Will you be able to do that for a year? Will you find and be able to, to talk about things consistently for a year with zero expectation of anything in return other than maybe the warm and fuzzies that you might get? Yes, you can make money and there's ways to do it, yeah. but that should never be the reason why you start. Yes, it should be, especially if you have a business, it should be like a way to supplement your existing business. The po I don't think the podcast in the beginning should be the business. Right. Because it's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to grow an audience, especially now. Like there's so many podcasts out there now that <laughs> it's hard to get exposure and build up an audience because no matter what you talk about, there's always a, there's probably a podcast or look, I'm a, I, I talk about a dorky pizza podcast that we talk about. And you know, there's, when I started in 2014, there was no other pizza podcast. And now there's a dozen other people doing the same thing that I do. So if I was to start today, it wouldn't be as unique as it was when I started, but it took time. Like I think five, no, maybe eight people listen to my podcast in the beginning and four of them live in my house. <laughs> but now it's yeah. different, you know? Yeah. I mean, look, when I started, there was maybe three of us doing Disney podcasts back in, in 2005. And yeah, it's grown, which I know sometimes scares a lot of people. I think it's wonderful. I, and, and I want to be clear when I explain this, that. I don't look at any other Disney podcasts as competition. And that's not, oh, I don't have any competition. What I mean is because of the, the podcast medium and the way it's consumed, you don't have to choose between one or the other. You can listen to my show and 10 other Disney podcasts. Right. That's fine. And I think that's the beauty of it because we all talk about things that are framed differently from different perspectives, whatever it might be. Not everybody feels that way. Um, because as yeah. the space starts to get more crowded, there is a, a very competitive element for people out there. Um, I get people all the time saying, why would you have another Disney podcaster on your show? Why would you coach another Disney podcast? I'm like, why would I not? Right. Like, what, what am I afraid of? Right. If I am not confident enough in the content that I am producing, then I'm the one who's doing something wrong. But if somebody else is doing great stuff, you better believe I want to. I care about my audience, right? Because they're my friends. I want, if there's something, somebody else doing great stuff, I want to share it with them. Yeah. Um, again, maybe not the, maybe not the philosophy that everybody has, but uh, I, I think there's room for us all to quote unquote win, to be successful. And I think on a whole, the tide rises for all boats for podcasting as a medium itself. Yeah. You definitely don't use Twitter that much. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I do, but I, I try and stay away, man. It's, yeah, I'm it's, kidding, but I, I agree with you, especially on the Disney podcast thing. Under the circumstance of you not copying other people's, I don't want to say content because the kind of content is kind of the same, but the style, right? Like if you do a podcast, it should be the reason or, or the way your podcast is going to grow consistently is if you are you, right. you know, and you'll attract the people that like your style and like your personality and repel the people that don't fit. But if you're fake and you copy somebody else's style or template, then it's not going to be something that you'll be able to sustain. And I think there's two aspects of that because you're hundred percent right. So one, I think that podcasting, and I hate the fact that authenticity is a marketing buzzword because we should be authentic all the time, but I think it is the most genuine and authentic because it is such an intimate medium. You literally in somebody's ears, Listeners can tell if you're faking it. They can. You, <laughs> yeah. you can't. You can't pretend to love something because they'll hear the inflection in your voice. And I'm sure you know, they can tell after listening over time 
if you're happy, if you're sad, if something's wrong, hey man, you didn't sound like yourself on this yeah, show. Yeah. Everything was everything cool. And on the opposite side of that, or maybe in conjunction with that, so I don't listen to other Disney podcasts. And that is not as no, that is not meant to be offensive to any other. I don't listen for two reasons. One, when I'm not podcasting about Disney, and, and the few times I do get in my car to listen to a podcast. I want to listen to something else right. um, that is going to, again, entertain or educate me. And two, I can never, ever be accused of copying somebody, stealing an idea, riding on somebody's coattails because I don't pay attention to what other people are doing. I do the show each week, Bruce, that I would want to listen to. I interview the people that I would like to just sit down and have a conversation with and hope that somebody else likes that too. And I think... If, whether you're starting out on your podcast, or you're trying to figure out how to turn the corner and, and move the needle and make it grow, going out and listening to other podcasts and going, oh, that format works for this guy. I'm going to now ask my interviewees the same 10 questions every week. It's not going to work because it's not you and you're trying to, there's no blueprint for what we do. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes, so I've done between the pizza podcast, this podcast, and other podcasts I have, I've done like probably, I know you've done a ton too, like. I've probably done 800 episodes of wow. podcast, and I always get questions from potential guests or like, Hey, can you send me a list of questions that get that you're going to talk about on the show? I'm like, you know what? I'll send you a list of questions, but I can tell you right now that I probably won't get to any of these because I'll ask you and like you and I did this podcast. We had no prep beforehand. It's just a conversation we're having right off the cuff. And I feel like those are the best kinds, at least for me, those are my favorite kinds of podcasts where, you don't know where the direction is going to go. The conversation leads the direction. And if I sit here and I have like, oh, what's question number seven is, how did you start <laughs> podcasting? It's, it doesn't sound fun. It sounds more like schoolwork. And I love what Neil deGrasse Tyson said. He said, school needs to be fun. And when you incorporate fun into learning, you remember more about it. So I try to make these podcasts that I do humorous, fun, not the same every time. So if you listen to last week's podcast, it's much different than this mm -hmm. one. I want to get your take on that. Do you have like a script for your podcast or is it kind of like wherever it goes, it goes? Wherever It's a conversation. And my feeling since day one has been you, my friend, the listener, yep. is sitting at this table with us, listening in and being part of this conversation. Uh, again, same thing, man. If somebody asks me for questions, I'm like, I don't have them. Like, and I love the, and I, it's funny you say this now because as we've been talking, I've been saying to myself, like, I dig the fact that you're not sitting there reading off a script and just going down. Like, this is just a, a natural conversation that we're having. Um, you know, as I get people saying, um, they'll say, oh, I'm going to send you the questions for an interview. I'm like, you don't have to because I'm not going to read them. I, I don't <laughs> right. want to prep ahead of time. And, and, it, and I don't necessarily love either as somebody who is is – being invited to guest on somebody's show or even listening to somebody's show when they've got their scripted questions and you can tell they're not listening to the answer that they're getting yes. because they're already moving on. Like you didn't just mention the fact that he was abducted by aliens because you've already <laughs> moved on to your next question about where he went to college. And I think that's, you know, that comes hopefully over time, especially for newer podcasters. Um, I think, we're all nervous at the beginning and we have to write things out, especially we have a guest, but you have to be prepared and confident and comfortable and just let the conversation where it's go, where it's going to go. Yeah. And that comes definitely with experience and time. I always tell people when they find my podcast, they're like, Hey, I found your podcast. I love it. I'm like, great. Please don't go back and listen to the first 25. <laughs> right. uh, matter of fact, I might delete this one. When delete right. this <laughs> I say episode one was six and a half minutes of pure hell. <laughs> like do not, which of course means everybody's going to go back and listen to episode one again. True. Um, but I think the best compliment you can get is when a guest says to you, or you ask them a question and they go, wow, you really did your research. Like there, I, uh, somebody says that to me. I'm like, I dropped the mic. I'm like Yahtzee. That's the, that is the best thing that somebody can say to make you feel good because you know that not only were you prepared, but that they see that and they acknowledge it. Yeah. No one's ever said that to me. You hey. are incredibly well prepared, by the oh, way. Oh, thank you so much, though. I appreciate it. <laughs> first time. This is a first time for everything. They're, they're right Ridiculously about handsome, very well prepared, great <laughs> podcast. I'll give you any, any sound bite you need. I got you. All right. I recorded all of those, so I'm going <laughs> to clip those out for later use. Um, 
back to pod, I don't know this 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 whole show kind of went on a podcasting turn, but I, I enjoy it because I think I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for podcasting too, and I think that you know everybody could start a podcast as long as you're into it and you want to talk about that for the long term. But at some point when you do a podcast, a couple questions I have for you. Number one, when should you give it up or when do you know if it's not working? And number two, how does someone monetize a podcast if they've been doing it for a while, they have a good size audience? Like, is there a way to monetize that's not, doesn't feel weird about it? So one, the day that this stops being fun for me, the day that I stop being excited to get up in the morning and stay up late on a Sunday night is the day I stop doing it. Um, it started off as a passion project. It has remained exactly that. It is the thing that fuels my fire of all the different things that I do. Podcasting still remains at the core. Um, in terms of monetization, you know, how much time do you have? Because there are now so many different ways to do that. And I think that you could monetize the content. I, I hate to sort of put it this way, but you can sort of monetize your audience, your community. And again, it's, 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 you build the community first and then you can monetize them. Because look, there's, there's the obvious ways, right? So you, how do you monetize the content? You do it with simple, easy, anybody can join an affiliate program tomorrow, right? right. Finding ones that are organic to the content you're creating. I am not going to be advertising no, you know, uh, accounting software or, you know, external hard drives because it's not what my audience cares about. Right. Same thing with uh, a partner or a sponsor, right? Which, which I think th there's a delineation between those words. And I like to have partners over sponsors. They are ones that are organic to the content and organic to the audience. They are relationships that I have. Look, I've had a travel agency partner for 14 years um, wow. that is not just somebody who, you know, I do a live read and has a banner on the site, but who is part of the content creation. She now is the face and the voice of her brand. And it's a great way to create and share content in a way that's not necessarily an advertisement. Um, when I say monetize your audience, I don't mean that in, in a bad way. What I mean is we do, you know, paid events. I have products that I create that your audience who, again, if you treat them like your friend, because that's how they view you, they will not only want to consume what you create, but they will want to help you as well. Yeah. So we do paid events. We do group cruises. I've had multiple books, audio tours, a magazine, whatever. Um, they will also, if you recommend a product or a service, they will be more inclined to, um, to purchase or, or to use it. And then look, I think things like Patreon are, are a godsend for podcasters because it, there's a, a pre-built platform that will allow you to, when I did Patreon a number of years ago, I was, I was hesitant because I'm like, I, I don't want to cannibalize my content and be like, well, now you have to sort of, right. there's a paid sure. gate to get this type of content or this interview or the full interview, whatever it is. So without cannibalizing my content, I said, what can I provide to them to say thank you, to give something extra? But if you are treating people, like I said, that caring at scale, that nurturing of the community, they will want to help you. And that's how Patreon started for me was somebody really emailing me saying, hey, man, I've been listening to you for years. Like, you've given me all this free stuff and you've never sent me a bill. I've never paid for anything that I've gotten from you how can I help you? Like, what can I do? And I said, wow, this is really, it's really telling. Um, and I was very hesitant to, to even jump into the Patreon waters, but I was also very clear in, in that it wasn't me just asking for money. It's, hey, this is a way that I can deliver additional things to you over and above the podcast. And if you want to help, it's completely optional. Um, and, and fortunately, the response has been great. So I think Patreon once you build the foundation of the community, yeah. not the opposite way. Cause so many people are like, Hey man, I've been podcasting for six months. Where's my money. That's not how it works. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. That's crazy. Um, I, I agree with Patreon too. Like you said, you got to build up that community first. And if you do build up that community and offer them something in addition to what you've already delivered for a while, they'll, they'll follow you there. How come celebrities can get away with hawking crappy products, but podcasters can't. <laughs> well, because They've got that, look, we're, Bruce, at the end of the day, we're in the relationship business, 
I don't care what kind of content you create, what you do, you are in the relationship business. And the relationships that you form with your listeners, viewers, community, whatever it is that you want to call people, is going to dictate what they're willing to consume from you, right? And if they feel like something that you're doing is disingenuous or just to make money, they may be like, you know, man, I, I love you on the podcast, but now you're starting to do this. Um, I think you're able to do that too, maybe on a smaller scale than, you know, a Jenner. I don't even know which, <laughs> who the Jenners are, but I know that they make a lot of money with, you know, or a Kardashian or whatever it might be. Yes. Um, but you are able to do that on, on a smaller scale. Yeah, I do. I have learned over the years. I remember my first email from someone um, way back when I was probably doing the podcast like a year and a half and somebody emailed me, Hey, uh, what's it cost to be a sponsor on your podcast? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was like Googling, how do you charge podcast sponsorships on a I was like, how much do you charge? Now I was get. I forget what I was getting. I was like, all right, email them back. I'm like, all right, a hundred dollars an episode. And they emailed me back and they're like, no problem. I'm like, dang it. I should have, I should have said $500 an episode. I, they, they responded way too quick for that. Um, but I learned that it is a relationship with the sponsor as well, because what I've learned is that when you talk about something on your podcast, you're given your stamp of approval for that. So you better know that whoever uses that product is going to get a good, uh, a good experience or have a good experience because if they don't, they're not going to really go to that product. They're going to go to you as the podcaster who told them to use that product. And that's happened to me a couple of times. So over the years, I really vet and I only have sponsors on my podcast that I, I either use myself or I know people who have had good experiences with them. And if it is a bad experience, it's like a one-off. It's not like something that's the usual for them. You find that as well? Without a, without a doubt, man. You are, you are right on the money once again. Um, who, and forgive me for sort of put, using this vernacular, but you know, who you get in bed with is ultimately a reflection on you. Yeah. And you are responsible for that. And I'll tell you a quick story going, I'm going to show you how long ago this, this was. So ages ago, this was literally pre-YouTube, man. I had a, a sponsor that created a series of like ride-through DVDs, like literally like you can tell they were like sticking stickers on them in their basement and selling them out. But this was unique and there was no way to get that kind of content. And they sold them at a very high premium. And I love the content. I was like, this is great. I had little kids. We watched them. And at the beginning, they were killing it. I mean, we sold a lot of DVD, you know, 20 DVD packs, whatever it was. Then for whatever reason, the quality got bad, the service got bad, they became unresponsive. And to your point, who did they come to but me? Hey, I can't get in touch with them. My DVDs were scratched. I never got it. Bruce, I refunded out of my own pocket every single body, every single person's full wow. price. I wasn't like, well, let me get in touch with them and see, no questions asked. I'm like, here's your $199 back. Wow. Because that's what, yeah, that's what they sold for at the beginning. Then it was, here's your $99 back. Because I want those people to have confidence in me and know that if, if this is what's happening, then, and I did, I obviously I cut that relationship off right away. Wow. That's a, that's, I mean, you're right though, because like they come back to you and they look, then you, not only it's always like, so I, I come from the restaurant world too. And it's like, you know, if someone has a bad experience, they tell 10 friends. If someone has a good experience, they may tell one. Right. So they always spread the word of bad experiences way faster than they do good ones, which is unfortunate. <laughs> but the ones that do spread the good, it's very powerful. Yeah. It is very, very powerful. And believable, right? Because you, 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 I'm sure you use Yelp. You go on Yelp and you're like, see, you could literally tell the, the reviews on Yelp, bad reviews of people who were just bitter. And they're exaggerating. <laughs> you, you didn't really, that didn't really happen to you that way. You're exaggerating a little bit. But then you can tell the ones that are genuine. Like, hey, listen, I went in there. It was an off night. It didn't, it didn't go as I usually have planned. Okay, that's a good, bad review. If there is a good, bad review. At least right. it's telling the business something. But you can tell, like, the people who are bitter about their like, – they got something wrong in their order, and they're just going to Yelp to complain about it because they love to do that. And, Drew, I think that's true on a, on a much grander scale. I'll use Disney. I say this all the time. Disney could pull every single ad off TV, radio, newspaper, magazines, the Internet if it wanted to. Why? Because the reason why people go to Disney World is not because they see this ad for 10% off. They go because their friends come back, their coworkers come back and go, oh my God, we just came back from Disney and my daughter was dressed like Cinderella and Cinderella came over and there was this incredible moment. It's not about the rides. It's not about the food. It's like that 
exceeding of expectations yeah. that guests have, that's the reason why I'm like, yeah, I want my kids to have that. We need to go to Disney World in the middle of summer like when the prices are highest and it's most crowded because that's what I want my kids to have. It happens the same with your podcast, yeah. your restaurant, whatever your business might be. You know, speaking of like spreading the word, I have a question for you. So you do a live show on Facebook. Um, how, when did you start on, when did you move it to Facebook? Do you remember the, the, the year? Gosh, I'm going to probably, I'd have to look and see, man. It's probably 2000, yikes. I'm going to, I'm going to regret throwing out a number, but what? I'm thinking like 13, 14, maybe even earlier than that. Maybe, maybe even right? earlier than that. You were one of the first beta users in live, right? Yeah. So right, why? Because at first, right? Because at first, that's right. It, at first, they were only doing live for quote unquote celebrities and things like yeah. that. Um, and then you had to sort of get an invitation to try live. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember we started a live show on Blab, if you remember Blab. Yeah, yep, yep. And that was before Facebook Live came out to everybody or every business page. Um, but obviously, YouTube was pretty popular back then. I have a, so why, why did you choose Facebook over YouTube to do your live show? And do you regret that now or do you not regret it? So, again, I'm a broken record with this word, man. And it is not a marketing buzzword, but it's community. Um, and the, the thing about YouTube, because, look, YouTube has the reach, uh, yeah. obviously, right? But what you, YouTube doesn't have, what it lacks for me is the ability to create community. And what I mean by that is, yes, you can post a video, you can do a live and people can comment. But if I'm a fan or a friend of what you do, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't go to your YouTube channel and start a conversation and start a thread about where's the best place to get pizza in Orlando. Right. I can comment on your video and hope that somebody responds. So I think that that for me is, is the community aspect that's been lacking there. You, there's, there's plenty of different ways now to multicast and, and go live to multiple platforms at the same time, which you, you can do with some effectiveness. But at some point, I had to make a choice and say, okay, Facebook needs to be the place where I direct people because that is where the community currently exists. That right. is the land, rented or otherwise, in which the clubhouse is built upon, unfortunately. I would love in a perfect world, Bruce, to be able to take that back and put it on my site. And I think eventually we're going to get there again yeah. as not just content creators, but consumers start to get more and more frustrated with algorithms, pay to play, all the things that we unfortunately have to deal with as creators on somebody else's platform like Facebook. Yep. Um, but for now, that's, that's where it works. And, and it works for me in the community. Yeah, I think that, that's a good way to put it. Like you did it for a different reason than most. Like some other people may, may do videos. Like you see a lot of popular YouTubers and bloggers, they do videos and they put them on YouTube because they're not looking for that back and forth conversation. They're just looking to get as many views as they possibly can. YouTube is owned by Google, which is kind of a search engine. People go there for info, which means they can get more views. You're not doing it for that reason. Yeah, and I try and, and, and this was something I struggled with and still do um, for a long time, which is, do I potentially risk greater reach for a central focus location? Because what ends up happening is the, the messaging gets very convoluted and very confusing. Because all of a sudden at the end of your show, at the end of whatever, like, okay, so follow me here. The conversation's <laughs> here. Watch here, like here, lives here, buy here. And people are like, wait, where, where am I supposed to go? So I wanted to make it as easy for people and say, Go to WW Radio. This is not a plug, but go to www.radio.com slash clubhouse. And they know that that's where that conversation is going to take place. I'll post everything I need to there. It, you know, obviously separate from, you know, the podcast, et cetera. Yeah. And by the way, clubhouse isn't the app clubhouse. That's what it you call the it. App clubhouse. It, it was the clubhouse long before clubhouse, but um, to your point, man, clubhouse and the changes that are coming to Facebook and other platforms now, going back to the idea about, you know, why and when should I start a podcast, I think is going to be huge for podcasting because all of a sudden the audio only medium is going to be put very much in the sights of, of everyday consumers that might not consume podcasts right now. All right. All right I lied. This is the last question. Uh, what are your thoughts on Clubhouse? 
so I think Clubhouse was was great again because of that, right? It allowed you to not just consume but participate in yeah. um, live audio. You don't have to worry about how's my lighting, how's the video, you know, how's my hair. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't like the fact, and I think to much to possibly the Clubhouse's. Um, the fact that it was for such a long time and continues to be invitation only like yeah. that barrier should have been taken down much, much earlier. I also don't like the fact that if you miss it, it's gone. Yeah. There is no way to record those or replay those later on. Um, I, I also wonder and question not, not the ROI of clubhouse, but the conversion. And, and that's not in a marketing sense. It means if you participate in a conversation and somebody likes you, how far down are they willing to drill? Cause you have to drill a little bit like, Hey, I really loved what Bruce was talking about. Now I've got to find his profile, drill, drill, drill. I got to find his link to go off clubhouse right. to subscribe to what you do elsewhere. Um, and to not, not too often a tangent. I think TikTok suffers from that a little bit too. It's the conversions off the platform to where your home base really is. Yeah, I agree with you. And the other thing that, so I, I, I don't know, I've been on Clubhouse, I think I joined in like January or December. And uh, Michael Stelzner, who I know you know, because we, we've been to a couple conferences that he runs, yeah, you speak at them as well. Uh, he, he runs a really good room because it's concise. Um, it's exactly what you know you're stepping into when you go into the room and there's no, you know, random conversations that have nothing to do with the topic. The other thing that I don't enjoy about Clubhouse that other platforms have is there's no validity to the people speaking. There's a lot of people speaking on stage on clubhouse and you're like, what the heck are you talking about? And you go to look at them, you, you click on their photo and their profile is unbelievable. This person is like the most successful entrepreneur in the history of entrepreneurs. And then you click on their Instagram and they have three followers and you're like, how did you do all this stuff? And you have three followers, not that follower count matters, but if you're talking about Instagram and hacks to grow Instagram, you should have more than three followers. And that's the thing I don't enjoy about Clubhouse is like, you don't know who to listen to because there's no real reason to vet them, I think, right. in my opinion. It's, it's a blessing and a curse because everybody has an equal voice. Right. But everybody has an equal voice. So how do you, and, you know, I was on Clubhouse very, very early on. Um, and very quickly, the marketers ruined it because yes. all of a sudden, I was, I had to turn off notifications because it was just all of these like spammy, smarmy marketing. And I'm like, and it, it pushed me away from the platform a little bit because I had to sort of wade through all that to get to people like Stelzner's and yeah. other great content creators uh, in order to get, you know, dig through the muck to get through the gold. Yeah. And if you're listening to this, don't ping me in any room after eight o'clock. I'm old. <laughs> I'm in bed by then. <laughs> pinging me in rooms at 10 o'clock who i'm on my couch watching tv who wants to talk in clubhouse at 10 p.m at night but i think clubhouse also paved the way for what facebook is going to introduce and facebook watched and and they learned and they will integrate something similar and probably much more refined to an already monstrous user base yeah you're right i hope they do i i think that i, ho I hope they do i hope they do i do you know, once in a while, I'll get something on a clubhouse, but I don't spend a whole lot of time on there. I, I may open some rooms. And I may, as people get used to it more, do things like this, where maybe you and I record this podcast and we let people know we're recording the podcast in clubhouse. And then after we spend 10 or 15 minutes answering questions live, I think that would be a cool way to do it. Right. All right. I promise. That was the last question. Lou, right, <laughs> plug away. Where can people go say hello to you on social media or your website or if they want information? I know you do coaching. So if anybody's looking to get podcasting help, I know you can help with that. Thank you. And look, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I don't, I always feel weird plugging stuff. All I'll say is that everything that I do on the Disney side of things is at wdwradio.com and everything else I do on the speaking mentoring side is at lumangelo.com and I'm at lumangelo on all social. And if you see him at a conference, super nice guy, say hello. Uh, we've had many conversations, well not many, we had a couple conversations the two times we met at social media marketing world. So Lou, I appreciate you. I will link everything up. Don't go anywhere. But I'll link all that up in the show notes for this episode. So if you want to get a hold of Lou, where is your preferred social media platform that you hang out on? Facebook and Instagram. And you're at Lou Mangello on both of those? Yes. All right. We'll link those up as well. Lou, don't hang up, but thank you so much for hanging out with me here on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, brother. I really, really, really appreciate it.